And welcome, everybody, to another episode of Smart Money Circle. My guest today is Julie Johnson McVeigh, CFA Managing Director of Fresh Pond Capital, which is division of Reiner's McVeigh Capital Management with approximately $2 billion in assets under management. Julie, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Julie, I always like to begin by asking, can you tell us your story and how you got involved in this business? So it may be a little bit unusual compared to some of the people you talk to. I, um, I'm actually from the Midwest and from a wealthy family where money was both ubiquitous and never spoken about. Okay. So I was totally disoriented around money for kind of the first half of my life. And um, in college, I pursued majoring in women's studies and history and really was fascinated about deconstructing the personal, this idea of the personal as political. And I think that's true for me as far as understanding money class and how we organize our financial lives. Um, after college, my first job was as a community organizer. I worked for the Pergs and Sierra Club. And do you know what a Canvas director is? A Canvas director? Yeah. No, for art, I'm assuming? But so, no. Well, no, no. Canvas that you clipboard and go door to door knocking, asking, raising funds for the group you're working for. Okay. So it's like campaign organizing. So it's the essence of kind of community organizing, knocking on doors and talking to people and asking them for money, which as someone who was raised in a wealthy family, I was petrified of. And I was committed, and I feel like it was probably the beginning of, for me, learning to talk about money. Um, and from there, I um, came into working in socially responsible investing, and um, I got my CFA accreditation, at, which is like a MBA for stock pickers. Um, and I think of the field of landing in socially responsible investing is really this marriage of values and money um, and, and thinking about the two of them in our lives. So um, 12 years ago, I was part of the founding of Fresh Pond Capital, which is a division of Rogers McVeigh. I think of it as my dream job. I get to work with people who are passionate about their lives and figuring out um, most of us do live our lives aligning and thinking about our values and um, money has been separate from that kind of analysis or alignment for many people. I would say that's really changing in the last two years. I mean, the socially responsible investment movement and, and businesses have been around for 30 years, 40 years, and um, in the last three to five years, um, you're really seeing an interest of people saying, oh, I don't have to make money from fossil fuels. Oh, I can pick what's in my portfolio, um, which I think is exciting. Love it. So <laughs> before I ask the next question, this is interesting, from coming from a wealthy family and then working in the money management business and being told not to talk about money as you were brought up in your childhood. So a lot of people have a, I guess, a bad money map is what I call it, or they're taught that, mm. you know, having money is evil or, you know, rich is being bad. I always like to joke around filthy rich. I mean, if anything, literally it's the exact opposite, but people say filthy rich, right? So can you speak a little about, about how you were able to overcome some of those mental, I guess, walls is what I call the mental walls with respect to money and what you see when it comes to investing and clients, what blocks they have or walls they put up? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. I think what I tell people first is just to write down every unspoken money message that they learned. And it's fascinating when people think about it. I mean, this is the idea of our actions speak louder than our words. Right. That, you know, or there's encoded messages to our kids. Um, and I've heard from um, clients and from friends messages like, you shouldn't ever get paid for your work because you'd be taking a job from someone who needs it and, right. and you have enough money. Right. Or you can't ever say no when someone asks you for money because you have it. So right. these rules, and I, 
I, I think of the, the one that you can't say no, that we tell people like, so you've lost that agency and the ability to, to use that word no because of what size your portfolio is. Um, and, and my own story was one where I, um, in seventh grade, had a school assignment of ask my father how much money he made. And this was in the 80s. And he said, $50,000. And I said, okay. And I didn't know at the time he was lying. Someone had told me that that car he drove was cost $50,000. So in my seventh grade mind, I thought he must have saved a year for it. And just had a warped perspective for a very long time of really the wealth divide. And my family kind of said we were upper middle class. There were just what you're saying of like mitigating the truth that we were wealthy and lived next to our country club and went to private school and had four kids. But this kind of, I don't know, shying away or denial of it um, to me was really interesting and, and just learning, stepping into um asking questions. I think that's one piece that I, I've learned and I encourage is that there often are not questions encouraged. The idea of a script is that the money manager talks and the individual listens mm-hmm. and to say, I don't understand that. Um, right. Adam, you and I spoke a little bit about uh, this whole jargon that the financial industries created, and I think of the words kind of of alpha and beta and basis points, the fact that a lot of fees are quoted instead of saying, well, I charge $200 or I charge $2,000. Right. It's, it's given as almost a you euphemism know, 50 of 50 basis points. Right, yes. right. So it's just a disorienting field. And I think traditionally, not to convict any one responsible party, but traditionally it was one of distancing people from their money and their investments. So it was not to kind of either worry your pretty little head about it or to look too closely, um, but questions were discouraged as opposed to really like, let me understand what I'm invested in and what that means. Right. No, that makes perfect sense. And to go back to your earlier point about the questions, I love that you asked, what what were you told about money uh, from the unwritten point of view? And breaking down those walls is really, really important because it's all just made up. <laughs> it's made believe. So, oh, totally. Yeah. Okay, good. So I love that. So can you tell us a little about your investment strategy, please, Julie? Yeah. So actually, it builds on that, that I think of there's some key words when I think of our strategy. And one is transparency. And transparency, to see what you own and why, to be able to ask about what transparency looks like for us is owning 30 to 40 individual stocks. So I'll see uh, an individual's investment um, portfolio when they come into our firm, and there can be pages and pages of stocks. And I don't know if that's like a quant model, but the piece of that... I think you lose the transparency when you flood someone with that many names. I think you also lose um, that you expose to more risk to this idea of actually to have, we believe, 30 to 40 stocks, you can have diversification with concentration. To actually concentrate on your best ideas, you limit the variables and and limit risks. Um, so the transparency for a client to be able to see that we don't hold mutual funds or ETFs other than I mentioned that we have um, just in 2019 started our own mutual fund um, as a way to reach portfolio or investors who have smaller portfolios and are looking to invest with our discipline. Um, transparency also is when we look at each stock, we care about how they make their money. So we're not buying Wall Street's research. We're actually looking at stocks and balance sheets and saying, how much debt do they have? How do they make their money? Is there a transparent path to earnings? Um, Another couple pieces that we have low turnover, that we buy and hold stocks. Um, We think of this as the difference between traders and investors. 
word long term when we buy a stock. It's like being in a relationship. Um, and we do think money is maybe shifting it from being a transactional to a relational um I don't want to say just business, but a kind of approach. And it's something that we've done this for a long time is that um, when the market charts and we have a week like we had last week with the market way down, we ultimately own stocks that we believe in. And we've done a lot of work with us where we've talked to management and, and we believe in these as businesses that will weather, choppy weather. Um, so what we see over time is that the market can drop off sharply and our stocks will go down too. But also it just, we find that um, we have more peace of mind and our goal is really working with clients that they have more peace of mind, that they know what they own and why. Right. Um, so and a couple other pieces just that we um, look at stocks top, down and bottom up. What that means is we're really looking for overall um, themes in the portfolio to think about universal health care and affordability. Who is in that sweet spot, um, like a telehealth company that is really reducing the cost of medicine while reaching more people or healthy living? One, one client asked once, kind of, how do you know if you're in front of a trend or if it's waning, and we think of actually these trends are really lasting ones, and this idea of the arc of humanity is arcing towards being more responsible, and so if that's the case, and that we're optimists that we believe it is, what happens in the future for companies that bottle, that are creating the plastics that are polluting our oceans? We think that the government's going to at some point catch up and create a tax on those companies, and they're not going to be great investments. So while you can make a buck in them, or you know, we, we've never bought tobacco stocks, or um, I can think of some other industries. You know, we we just think of long term killing your clients is not a great business model. So let me just jump in for a second to clarify for yeah. the audience. So basically, it's social responsible long term investing. You have 30 to 40 positions because you want to be diversified, but also concentrated. And then you, you look at more of like the high level when investing in businesses, you want to make sure that their profitability comes with being healthy, has that arc of humanity, <clears throat> excuse me, has that arc of humanity component where you're doing good for society, that social responsible factor, it's eco-friendly, and it has low debt. Is that correct? Yeah. And we look for innovation. innovation. We, we really say like, who's out there creating something that doesn't exist right now. And, you know, we can all think of kind of the, the players, but now the way that kind of our mobile technology, the way that we all walk around with phones that 25 years ago to, to really say, okay, it's not always an accounting piece, but we have researchers who do a lot of the valuation pieces on stock, but some of it, there's an interesting um stock that is investing in how to create technology around a paper bottle that instead of a plastic bottle holding carbonated water. Nice. So we're really looking at who's who's trying to solve problems or a recycling company that we met with the CEO and he was so passionate about recycling and when we talked about his competitors he said he was he just is a real engineer and said no People, we're solving these problems that other people aren't even thinking about of how to recycle um, the waste that is being created. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. So uh, my next question to you, I guess, Julie, is how do you handle risk and what mistakes do you see people make with respect to risk management? Yeah, and actually that's a great um, piece for, for two parts of our strategy that I um, didn't mention. One is that we look to be contrarian. Okay. So contrarian, and I think a lot of people talk about this, and it's hard to do, but it, it's, it really is. I, I think of Warburg, but it's words of um, when the market is, uh, when people are scared to be brave and when people are free to be scared. So 
Um, but have fear when others are greedy yeah. and be greedy when others are fearful? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. So the, the, this idea that um, handling risk, some of it we work with asset allocation and, and using that contrarian piece. So we um, just kind of recently have been holding extra cash for clients and had pressure. I had some calls in January just of pressure saying, you know, the market, you know, why, why are you holding so much cash? Why are you holding so much cash? And the market turns. And I often talk to clients about the market being a Venn diagram of you have fundamentals and then you have the perception of those fundamentals. And that really is um, kind of equal pieces that the fundamentals maybe didn't change and yet the perception changes. Um, and our approach ultimately is to then say, okay, let's average into the market. Or when it's really hot, let's average out, meaning kind of um, paying attention to asset allocation and, and taking some money off the table or diversifying. Um, so one other piece kind of a, is a risk that we see out there is the amount of indexers or closet indexers out right. there. And do you know what I mean by that term? Yeah, I was going to ask you to clarify. Just long-term passive investing, but please clarify for the audience. Yeah, yeah. so it, it is it's um, the idea that everyone has moved into um, these vehicles, and, and we wrote a letter calling it the um, number of kind – of, it's like having more sp – sports teams than baseball players and that, you know, that there are actually more investment vehicles and ETFs and, and for than actual individual stocks. And so what happens then in a downdraft is that the vehicle may be sold and everybody, it just is the domino of selling. Um, so by investing, we're not closet indexers. So I, the S&P 500, the difference of the energy sector allocation or the financial sector allocation um, is like 10 to 13 percent. And ours might be two to three percent. And in general, for financial stocks, we find them really opaque, that we don't think um, it's clear how they're making their money. We also don't see it really creating um, most often kind of something innovative or needed by society. And that's not to say we haven't found a couple, but um, in general, it's a harder area to invest. And then to be transparent about that with clients, to show them in their portfolio kind of this is what you don't own as well as what you own. So how do you, um, well, that's a great way to handle risk, but how do you specifically, Julie, handle the contrarian factor? Do you look at technicals? and say, hey, the market's too extended, up or down? Or do you look at fundamentals and say, hey, from an asset allocation standpoint, we're too, we waited too much long or we're too short? Or how exactly do you handle that? Yeah, I mean, well, we'll so we question. have weekly meetings where we're talking about the technicals in the market and looking at how, you know, we're, we're not trying to peg it to a certain percent. So that's the piece of kind of not being a closet. Um, index, and I, I think of advisors who will say, oh, I need to make sure that I match that percent. And that, I really think they're covering their behinds as far as not wanting a quarter to close and to differentiate. Whereas we're doing the opposite, that we're looking and, and talking about this last quarter of saying, gosh, what a high percentage technology now is of the S&P 500. And while we've been overexposed in technology and that's been a driver, I call it like a garden. We need to like clip back the mint or take some tomatoes out of the garden right. and reallocate them. And so, you know, but we're not trying to circulate just based on a quant model to then move into value stocks. But we basically kind of plant a garden and we build, plant a portfolio and then as positions grow and get too large for the portfolio, we then are cutting that back. So a, a piece of this, this proportionality and asset allocation, but also individual position allocation, that we won't let one stock overtake a portfolio. Interesting. So you don't make decisions based on the valuation or based on the price of the stock. It's more along the lines of what's good for the overall portfolio. Is that correct? 
Yeah, it's more so. I mean, I, there's no question our director of research at every meeting says, this stock's expensive, kind of and warns us about what the PE is. And, and, and when we see something that's expensive and we're really interested in it, and it's a new stock that we're introducing the portfolio, it means that let's be more gradual in averaging it into our portfolio. Understood. And what I mean by that, I call it like putting your toe in and then putting your ankle in and then putting your knee in and not just diving into the stock and saying, you know, we think this stock is the bee's knees. Let's buy it and own it. And what it means on the downside is kind of in an up market, we miss, you've got drag. You sometimes miss um, having a stock in a portfolio as large as you would have liked it. But what we do is we protect ourselves from the clients on the downside that we we have it in a portfolio. It may not be as large as um, we w would wish it to be, but we'll let it grow to that size. And then if it corrects, you'll see us buy it again. I'm often explaining to clients that we'll buy stocks three different times. And if we're nervous about the valuation or the market, we'll drag that out even longer. So kind of saying, okay, let's take six to 12 months to move into a stock position. Or if someone comes to us and has cash, we will take 12 to 18 months to put them towards an asset allocation that we want for building them into the market. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So question, do you guys use stops? Yes, so we buy individual stocks. No, I mean stops, excuse me. Like do you use sell stops, protective sell stops? If a stock falls X percent, you'll sell it? Or is it more long lens of let's look at the overall portfolio and then make a decision that way? And I think it was cutting out when you said that Sorry, do you use stops? Are we selling when it falls? Yeah, like do you use sell stops, protective sell stops? Oh, do we sell stocks? Yes. In term no. So that's the contrarian piece that we're not gonna sell a stock unless the fundamentals the the two pieces of kind of when we look to sell is one we'll move away from a stock if we think the fundamentals have changed. Okay. Um and um or we will trim a stock, and that more likely happens, is that we still say, gosh, we love the stock, but it's grown to being oversized in a portfolio. So when a stock actually that we're excited about goes down, we look at that as an opportunity to buy it. Okay. And we say, hey, what's going on here? Have the fundamentals changed? No, it's just the market went negative on it. Okay, let's add it to accounts if, if they can use it. Got it. No, it makes perfect sense. So I guess next question, Julie, is what are some timeless lessons you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience? So I love this question. I think of that there are um, a few. One that we spoke a little bit about um, or think about is the riddle of money. And when I think of it, it it's kind of like food that um, everybody might love it and too much of it and you get indigestion. So there's this piece of money that is, um, I think, unsolved and, and maybe because it's in the closet for a lot of people, it's, it's not kind of getting figured out of how much is enough. At what point does money become toxic in our lives instead of helpful? Right. So... I, I think um, that's a super interesting question for people to think about. I think there is a piece of money to recognize that it is energy. And what I mean by that is that money gets its meaning and its movement. And so it's really this like, okay, if it, it doesn't mean anything unless – Am I saving it for something for tomorrow and my future self? Am I giving it away or am I spending it? As we think about those acts, I, I encourage people to think about, and this is across the economic spectrum, to always have giving as much kind of present in their money management and thinking. Um, and there's a piece of scarcity begets scarcity um, that law of attraction. It's that idea that you might be looking for a job and you can't find one. And then suddenly we say things like it rains, it pours, you get three job right. opportunities. Right. You know, it's, it, it's that framework that really makes a difference. Um, and, and so with investors who have larger portfolios, I'm often encouraging people to think about 
then they may say, oh, I give. And it's the giving that they've done for the last 20 years, and they haven't adjusted percentages to reflect larger portfolios or larger incomes. Gotcha. So I think that's actually a mistake that a lot of us make is we give based on our comfort zone that maybe was set decades ago and not actually look at what percentage are we giving. Um, and, you know, I, I, a piece of what I love in this business is learning from the people I work with. And I just love how individuals think differently of um, and think outside the box. And, and one approach that um, I've had a number of clients bring to me is how not to just give away money, but how to give the power away. Right. So people are thinking more about not being daddy Warbucks and saying, you get money, you get money, you get money, but more who's a regranting organization that would distribute this money. Or I work with a number of people who are just finding activists in their community and asking them, will you please redistribute this money? Right. And I, I think of a few pretty famous people who kind of have done their giving just kind of going to, you know, some of it's along religious lines, but just giving blank checks and saying, here's a million dollars. You know the people who need this. Please make sure it gets there. No, right. That makes perfect sense. So those are the timeless lessons. What about some timeless mistakes you see people make and how do you avoid them? Yeah, timeless mistakes. Um, I mean, the I, I was thinking when uh, of this question beforehand of um, – one of the things I've learned is to ask the question that people can really read your mind. So I don't know if this is one that transfers to your clients, but um, that working with individuals with money is really this trusted, I feel honored to sit with people and to ask the questions that I think of, to ask them and to then also not feel like I'm putting people on the spots for not knowing the answers. So a lot of people don't know the answers, and I think that's okay, and not to feel intimidated. Um, a piece of that, um, so I, I guess for your listeners, a couple pieces, and maybe just by listening to this show, they're already, um, be okay asking questions. I think there are some gender lessons we learn that men are supposed to know about money and women aren't, and in my experience is women ask a lot or more questions and, than men um, at times. And so I, I, I raise that kind of piece. I, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of lose it funny if that's as helpful as um, more investing advice kind of thinking of. Yeah, so the emo you, check I, your emotional kind of the mistake that check your emotional um, barometer as you go to buy or sell if you're managing your own assets or calling your advisor. I think a good advisor really should be checking and saying like, yes, you know, are we selling into a downdraft because you need the money or because you're scared? Right. So um, to check where fear is playing in your money management plan. And um, try to stand on the other side. No, I love that. That's really, really big, big, huge piece of the equation, the emotions. And most people don't even talk about it. That's the biggest thing that blows my mind. So um, next question for you, Julie, is what is the best piece of advice you can share with the audience? So one is with your money manager, and this is so practical and mundane, um, but is to ask about fees. I think of the transparency of fees in our industry is not very transparent and not just kind of what percentage you might be paying, but to have reporting and say, once a year, will you give me a chart of what I paid you last year and will, in dollars, will you estimate what the mutual funds, if I'm invested in mutual funds, charge me? So I don't think people actually see how much money that they're spending um, and I think that's important. If you're spending over 1%, I think it's important to to know and recognize kind of what you're paying for. I think on a higher level for families to talk and listen 
about money. I think families with large amounts of assets have um, sometimes truncated conversations. And I think the importance of actually making space for emotions in those conversations. So what that might look like would be like a parent or grandparent to actually say, um, gosh, I'm really nervous about this because my parents never had this conversation with me. Right. Or I, I, I have a lot of fear about telling you these numbers because I don't want you to become vulnerable and taken advantage of or, right. or for you to feel different or, or lonely. Um, a piece of that, then a, a really another practical piece is if people are setting up irrevocable trust, which often people do for next generations, to include language where trustees can gift the assets. And I think this is so important. We've set up all of these vehicles that say for the rest of your life, this is held in trust for you. And there's no agency of collaboration with a trustee for a beneficiary and a trustee to say, actually, I want to gift some of these assets. I want to, you know, this stock has run up and I want to gift it to the environment or I want to gift and spend down this trust. Um, so I, when we go back to kind of unspoken messages, one of them that I heard growing up was kind of, you're not okay without this money that you're getting from your grandparents. Like you need this money and, right. and you better hold on to it. So there is a loss of agency that at times I've seen at an extreme that I think we can write better trust that empower beneficiaries um, to have more of a voice and more involvement in the trust. Now, that's a really good point because you empower the people instead of disempower them or create empowering beliefs instead of limiting beliefs and so on and so forth. And it goes back to the yeah, earlier point. It, about, it goes back to kind of the yeah. scarcity, the, right. the idea of like, <laughs> oh, right, I can't make a living on my own. I need this trust. Or the, you know, I don't think anyone's grandparents setting up a trust for them wants them that message conveyed. No, it's the exact them, opposite message, if anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, want, I want you to go change the world, go right. do great things. Well, Julie, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your insight with us. Uh, what is, before we go, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? You mean like phone number or email? Whatever you want to give. I mean, website, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, so um, freshpondcapital.com is our um Website and Reinders McVeigh is R E Y N D E R S McVeigh M C V E I G H dot com and um, yeah we'd love to hear from you I, I think we have emails up on those websites and we're happy to talk more beautiful well thank you so much Julie have a great day thank you.